Hey everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us today in our webinar, which is going to be about how you can create blazing fast dev environments with the help of Octeto and local stack. We are going to keep it very beginner friendly. So if you are not familiar with either of those tools, do not worry. We are going to walk you through what is happening and we have a really, really cool demo prepared for you as well. So let's just get started. A um, couple of introductions first. Um, I am Arsh. I work as a DevX engineer at Octeto. I'm also a CNCF ambassador. If anyone would like to uh, connect with me after this webinar, there's my Twitter there. You can reach out to me there. I post stuff related to platform engineering if you're interested. Um, just send me a message there. And Harsh, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. First of all, thanks, Arsh, and thanks the whole team at Octeto for inviting me for this webinar. Uh, hi, folks. I'm Harsh. Um, I work as an engineer at LocalStack, uh, and I'm also an AWS community builder in the serverless category. So really excited to, to talk about how LocalStack and Octeto powers your development and testing workflows together. And yeah, as Arsh said, we have a really cool demo, and I'm just so happy to share with you all of that. Cool. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And before uh, we start these things and, you know, show the demo, show the product, I feel it's really important to, you know, be on the same page about what problem we are trying to solve, because um, that that just generates sympathy. When you see, see the solution, you're able to empathize more with it and understand what we are trying to fix. So we have identified like three main challenges which you can fix if you use Octeto and LocalStack together. And those three challenges are on this slide right in front of you. The biggest challenge in my opinion is just the management of infra. As our applications have evolved to be more quote unquote cloud native, we have started adding more and more cloud services in our applications because they make lives easier. So that means an app which traditionally was just involving, you know, your application code, be it your front end, back end, and other microservices. Now it is also interacting with other services which are provided by different cloud providers. So that has become a very integral part of the application and the application development process. But what problem does it cause is something which people often forget because uh, when you deploy things, then everything looks fine, right? Like the cloud provider takes care of provisioning all of that. You have a team which is responsible for all of that. But the aspect which often gets missed is the development side of it, right? Because uh, when your developers are working on these applications which are using these resources, how do you give them access to this cloud infra, right? These cloud services. What what approaches do you take? And we feel that there is no, there hasn't been a consensus, consensus on a good approach because people have been trying out hacky solutions and we haven't really like stuck with something which works out of the box, is uh, does not raise huge bills on cloud providers and does not add to the cognitive load for developers. What I mean by cognitive load for developers is that for us, people who work with these technologies, work with these cloud providers, it might seem very simple, right? How tough can creating a storage bucket on AWS be? But you do not understand that people who are writing these applications, they might not be from this DevOps background or they might not have any experience with cloud providers. And let's just admit the first time we went to the AWS console, it was scary for us as well. So the fact is that you like introducing developers to these tools makes things complicated for them. They have to learn new things. And even if you, you know, do not go with the UI approach and say you want to use like infrastructure as code with Terraform or something, then you are exposing developers to those tools. So at the end of the day, you are adding an additional burden on top of developers already taxing work, which is writing code and working on the application, which is part of your team, which is your actual product. On top of that, you're ha handling them additional responsibilities of taking care of cloud provider services and infrastructure. The next problem is feedback loops. When you add this sort of infrastructure uh, in your applications, it becomes really tough to iterate on these applications and work on them. Why? Because each time you have to make a change, uh, you sort of have to, like, if you want to try something out, you have to set up a different environment, and that involves doing everything again and being exposed to these things. So basically, there is no easy way to get automated access to environments, and environments are long running and like they are not ephemeral so developers are not able to iterate fast on them and even after putting in all these efforts these environments 
fall short because they are not able to mimic what the actual thing looks like in production because in production you are using containers in production you're using kubernetes to manage them so there is a huge disparity between what you are able to achieve on your uh, local machine versus what the actual state in production is so these are two big problems i let harsh talk about the third problem which is remote debuggability uh, thanks, Harsh. I guess that was a really awesome explanation about how uh, managing developer infrastructure and slow feedback loops is pretty much plaguing the public cloud. Remote debuggability is like one of the critical aspects because if you're developing on the public cloud, one of the things that you will simply run into is that you simply cannot attach a debugger to your ID and just debug over the things or debug over the failures that you are encountering. And this is so much tedious because every time you make a new change, you have to go ahead and like push a change onto the public cloud and wait for the slow feedback loop to actually trigger in and give you the necessary validation that, hey, everything works on your machine or everything works on the public cloud, I would say, and this is working well. But what happens if something goes wrong? What happens if you have a red build on your CI or maybe on your branch? This is where things basically trigger out because now you simply cannot like hook your debugger to your ID. You cannot like debug through your code. You cannot figure out what's exactly going wrong. And this creates like a lot of friction. So remote debuggability is an aspect that not a lot of public cloud providers, especially AWS has been able to solve. Developers at the end of the day want better tools. They want a better developer experience. And debugging is something that people are looking out for. And as I guess Arsh and we have mentioned, like these three are the core troubles that has been plaguing like today's cloud development. Like no matter if you're working with containers or maybe serverless or maybe with uh, traditional compute services, this is a problem that you will be encountering in almost all aspects of uh, the cloud development and testing. Awesome. Uh, let's go to the next slide and explain the difference between outer loop and inner loop. And we feel the approach we're going to introduce you to is going to bring enormous benefits to your inner loop. And I let Harsh explain what the inner loop exactly is, and then we'll go on to what those benefits are. Yes, uh, the inner loop is pretty easy to understand. It's all about what's happening on your local machine. So as you can see on this particular diagram over here, we have this whole cycle of code, build, test, and debug. So this is traditionally what we call as an inner loop, like basically writing the code, testing it, getting a quick validation that, hey, everything works. And in such a way, you can basically iterate on multiple new features and get your code pushed out really quick. And once the code is pushed out, this is where we traditionally go into the outer loop setting. Like these outer loop settings are mostly these large or infrequent changes that you are pushing maybe to your continuous integration service or maybe to some public cloud or something similar. And this basically requires the deployment in an integration environment. I guess the easiest way that I can explain the difference between the two is like how you're building an app and every change that you do on your local machine should be reflected ideally over there. And in a similar basis, once you deploy your code, once you push a commit onto a branch, this basically sets everything on an ephemeral or maybe a staging environment. And this gives you a really quick validation and feel that everything is now working on a production identical environment because that's what Outer Loop is all about. So at the end exactly. of the day, yeah, Arsh, yep. I guess. Uh, I... So, hmm. yeah, uh, I want to add a bit on the inner loop side of things. So yeah. right now, if you think like the problems are there are a lot of problems in the inner loop because imagine you're a developer working on an application, right? Mm -hmm. If you have to, you know, get feedback that your changes are working and let's say, you know, you, your company is not able to provide you access to cloud provider resources or, and you're just working on the application code on your machine, getting feedback is really, really tough. And I'm not uh, like exaggerating because just consider the scenario, right? You write some code. Now you want to be sure that, you know, you're, tests are passing or you want to run some end-to-end -end tests on your entire application, there is absolutely no way of doing that for you until you go and commit your code, right? And even when you commit your code, right, it's not as simple as just committing it because you will commit your code, then it'll go and do run the CI processes, which would involve building the code you just put. And after all of that has happened, then your tests would kick in. And you see how like this just 
increases the time you spend on developing and increases the time between you as a developer writing code versus getting feedback from your code, from your tests. That is just enormous because you are now having to do these thousand different steps. It is no longer as simple as just writing code, hitting save and seeing your application live. And that is a perfect segue to our demo because that is exactly what we are going to show you. But uh, just before that, uh, we also want to introduce you to what exactly local stack does and what exactly Octeto does. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, I guess this is on me. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I guess we had like a really nice intro about like the traditional problems that we have with managing the cloud infrastructure, testing it up, and also the whole aspect of the inner dev loop versus the outer dev loop. And as Arsh rightly mentioned, right now there is no certain way, or maybe there is just no one way of doing things. It's all about that if you want to test on the public cloud, the initial norm was pretty much that you have to push the changes on the real cloud, get the validation over there before you can make further more changes. But this has now changed. Uh, now we have this tool called as local stack. Spoiler alert, I work over here. But I guess like local stack is one of the best tools that you can get out there that allows you to build your cloud applications pretty much on your local machine. So local stack started back in 2016, 2017. Um, like at Atlassian and over there, it was like the whole aspect of local stack was to basically mock the AWS services. So initially it supported services like S3 or DynamoDB or uh, maybe SQS. And these basically allow the developers to quickly write automated integration tests and get a quick validation that, hey, everything is working pretty much on our local machine. But over the past few years, we have kind of expanded the scope and we have integrated more and more emulation capabilities. And this basically means that now we are not just mocking because with mocking, we just have a, like a mock class. We have the request params, the response params, and then we are just get a quick check. With more of an emulation capability, you can actually spin up resources on your local machine. So if you're setting up something like an RDS database, Local stack will basically set up a Postgres on your machine, and that would basically give you a feel and understanding about what's exactly happening. So local stack has support for uh, more than 75 plus AWS services right now. Uh, some of these include like basic compute services like Lambda or ECS, databases, messaging, and more and more sophisticated APIs. Like if you want to do analytics with Athena, or maybe you want to do some uh, ETL stuff with Glue. And there are some more advanced collaboration features that would simply go beyond uh, the scope for this session. But if I talk about like the whole uh, ecosystem of local stack, that is not just uh, like traditional like infrastructure as code tools like Terraform or Pulumi or CDK. There are like more and more systems like for CI CD, we have got GitHub Actions, we have got GitLab. Uh, for local development tools, we have got the AWS CLI cloud formation. We have got SDKs with Python, with Spring, and mostly these are the, just the AWS SDKs itself. And we also support additional app development frameworks. Some of the ones that you might easily identify as test containers or Octeto, or the friendly neighbor over here, Octeto over here. So Arsh, do you want to maybe talk a bit about the Octeto itself? Yeah. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So. If you are not familiar with Octeto, what Octeto is, is a it's a platform for automating environments which are meant for development and testing, but are exactly like your production environments. So yeah. our goal is to allow platform engineers to create experiences for developers, which just allow developers to be really efficient in their work and focus on writing code, focus on innovation and shipping value while abstracting away all the complexities of this cloud native world, which have been introduced into developer workflows. And I think this is a good enough introduction for us to just jump right in and show everyone the Octeto platform. And I'll explain the things you see there in detail so that you'll see how we are able to create this wonderful experience. Um, so if you go here in this demo app, we are going to deploy a uh, application which basically allows you to you know, order food. So this application currently has three microservices. There's a menu where you can enter what you want to order. There's a kitchen service where after you enter stuff in the menu, the food goes. Um, uh, if you go there, you can see stuff on the kitchen service and then there's a check service where you can finally get the bill but this application like 
most applications today is also using cloud resources. So it's using um, SQS queue and it is using an AWS bucket on S3. But we want to simplify this workflow for developers. Let's say you as an organization do not want to, you know, take the headache of managing multiple accounts on AWS for your developers. So you want to make this part of their environment. So let's see how you can do that with the help of Octeto and LocalStack with that demo. Can you switch to the Octeto dashboard now, Harsh? I hope my screen is visible. Yep. Uh, Cool. Uh, so once platform engineers have configured Octeto for their developers, this is what the end result looks like. Developers get this interface where they can log in and create as many namespaces for their applications and for their like dev environments. So you see, this really allows you to spin up namespaces and work on applications in an ephemeral way. You can treat these environments as ephemeral environments. You can create them for each particular feature or each particular idea you want to test out, and you can easily destroy them without having to you know, manually take care of the headache of configuring things and gluing cloud provider services with application code and all of that. So let's just launch a dev environment which will allow us to work on this restaurant application. Awesome. Uh, I guess uh, the GitHub repository that uh, the slides basically pointed to is already present on the Octato GitHub org. We just have this one particular fork over here with just some documentation changes. So I'm just going to copy the GitHub URL over here. And once this is done, I can click on the launch dev environment. And this is where and I can choose the Git yep, URL. So um, Harsh is using the Git URL to deploy this, but if you go to the first menu, which is basically the Octato catalog, this is where you, uh, the platform team can basically configure all the applications part of your company, or you want to make it available for your developers to work on as part of this list. So you can see that Octato supports working with uh, different tools, like you can use your Helm charts to deploy your application, or you can use infrastructure as code tools like Pulumi, and you also have the ability to just take your Docker Compose files and directly deploy those applications on a cloud environment. So Harsh use the Git URL approach, which allows you to deploy from a Git repository. So once you deploy the URL and click launch, Octeto will start provisioning this environment for you. So what it is doing right now is that it is deploying all the microservices of your application on an actual Kubernetes cluster, the cluster where Octeto is installed, that is your dev cluster. So it is deploying all of the microservices which make up your application. And uh, to just to speed things up, we already have an environment uh, where everything is deployed. So if we switch to the context environment, you'll see that once the dev process is done, and if you press the drop down menu, you can see that all the check kitchen and menu microservices have been deployed. And not only that, but you also get endpoints where you can actually see this uh, replica of your application, which is just meant for development. So if you go to any of those endpoints, Arsh, um, as you can see, Maybe this is our menu, menu. Yeah, menu for our application. And this is a working copy of your application. And I really want to stress this out because it can be confusing to people who are not familiar with this idea of ephemeral environments, that this is not a production copy of your application, right? This is not something you that is user facing. This is meant for one particular developer, Harsh in this case, that is his, his he's logged in uh, to the Octeto instance using his account, and he can create as many environments as he wants for as many feature uh, or bug fixes he is working on. There is no limit on that, and that allows developers to just, you know, experiment and play around with applications without having to uh, worry about setting things up each time they want to try something new. And all of this is deployed on an actual Kubernetes cluster, which is very beneficial because now it means that you're working in an environment that is exactly like production, which is like, it is uh, just like production, which means you are able to, you know, get realistic feedback and you are able to, you know, see the changes you make and be sure that, you know, when you push to CI or when you push to prod, everything will work. So uh, if you go back to the dashboard, I think Harsh can now explain what's the local stack deployment we see there in that list. Uh, yeah, basically what local stack basically does is like it starts the local stack uh, as a Docker container. And how uh, Octato is basically doing that is using the local stack helm charts that we have available public and open source. So I guess, uh, Arsh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but there is a octato.yaml file over here yep. that basically provisions all of these resources, including the local stack uh, container right over here. 
So local stack Docker container basically acts as like a mini cloud operating system for the local stack runtime. And all of the services that uh, you can basically expect to see in an AWS application, like things like S3 or SQS or DynamoDB, local stack pretty much lazily load that. And this is basically done using different AWS SDKs or whatever integrations you might end up using. So in this case, uh, this particular application is using SQS, which is a distributed queue service that AWS provides, and also the S3, which is a globally distributed like object storage solution. And as you can see on the logs itself, uh, as soon as I ordered like some food through that application and it went to the kitchen microservice, a lot of different AWS APIs are being triggered over here. And this basically gives us a pretty nice analytics and telemetry about how your application is interacting with an emulated AWS uh, like service. So you can see like it has got a lot of SQS receive message API. And if I basically go back and maybe look at something like, let's say, uh, the check microservice. So this basically loads all of my orders. So you can see like I have already ordered tacos and like the total bill was about $5. Uh, I can click on the download receipt, which is basically served from an S3 bucket. And if I go back to my local stack logs, uh, there you will see that there is a get object API call that was made to the S3 service. Yep. So you see how using Octeto and local stack, you are able to get your developers right to this phase where all of the setup is just automatically done for them. And they do not need to have any knowledge of Kubernetes or deploying things on Kubernetes or even running containers for say, they don't even need uh, Docker installed on your local machine. So the, imagine like the, how much you can speed your onboarding process when you switch teams or you onboard new team members, because they just have to log into your Octeto instance, choose the application they want to work on and deploy a dev environment. But what happens after you deploy a dev environment, right? How do you work on this? With uh, That is pretty simple as well. And with that, Octeto places no restrictions. So developers are free free to use any tools they want to use. So I think Harsh's favorite IDE is VS Code. So he's using that. But if he goes back to his VS Code instance, you'll see that he has uh, connected to this Oct Octeto instance using Octeto CLI. You just run one single command called Octeto up, and then it lists down all the microservices part of your application. In this case, we wanted to make a simple change. So we connected to the menu microservice and you see that our files are in sync. So basically whatever code changes we make on our local machine, we You'll see them reflected on this uh, dev development copy of our application, which has been deployed. So let's change all this Mexican food to something Indian, maybe, and see if it's working. Yeah, I guess pizzas pizza. are not Indian. No, that's not <laughs> yeah. Indian. So maybe go for samosas. I guess the favorite one yeah, that for a lot delicious. of people. Yeah, <laughs> samosa, maybe kebab. Again, not Indian, but still like very much famous yeah. in India. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, maybe and some chai, like of course. Yeah, shy. Yeah. Uh, so now we now he hits save and let's go back to our Octeto U UI. Uh, since this was a node application, not really automatically build it. But if you see that if you go to the endpoint which we were at earlier, you can see the placeholder text for that has changed. And we made a very simple change in this application, but you can uh, just to demonstrate the point, but you can work on multiple microservices together. So you can launch Octeto up menu and Octeto up kitchen and work on them simultaneously and, you know, just play around with your application and work on like uh, any features or bug fixes you want without, uh, you know, being uh, slowed down by the complexities of setting up environments and managing infrastructure. So this was it for the demo. Do you, uh, does anyone have any questions right now? Because now would be a good time to just uh, write them out in the chat. Okay, I think we, we don't have any questions. Uh, so let's just show one closing slide where we want to show you what happens after this uh, dev phase where you have created your dev environment, written some code. Now you're happy with it. What can you do after that? Harsh, do you want to take this? Uh, sure. I guess one of my favorite features with Octator was the preview environments. And this basically allows uh, like users to set everything on the 
CI pipeline. So anytime you make a change, you push a commit to a branch and you make a pull request, look, Octeto will basically provision everything inside these preview environments. And this is one of my favorite features. Like my initial career started out as a front end dev. And over there, I was pretty much fascinated by how these preview URLs work with platforms like Netlify or Vercel. And exactly. with Octato, I guess you have this whole full stack ephemeral setups. And not on not just that, like you just don't deploy your front end, your back end, you also deploy your infrastructure now with the help of Perfectly. Stack. Yep. So the idea is that once you're done with all of this, you make a pull request and then Octeto takes care of deploying all the microservices with the latest code in that pull request, where as local stack takes care of provisioning all the cloud resources you need, and then you get a live copy of your application. So anyone who is like not working on the engineering team directly can also give you feedback because now they have a URL, which they can visit and play with the entire application, you know, let's say they did not like this, uh, they did not like the design of this website and they wanted something a little more uh, Bollywood themed maybe. So now they would not have been able to get this feedback had you not been able to, you know, create a working copy of this application because uh, building code is like just setting this up as engineers has become so complicated because you have to deal with all these cloud providers and all these, this is a very simple application, but imagine if you are working with like 15, 20 microservices, it's so complicated, but now they don't have to worry about that because with preview environments, you just get one single URL where you can visit the entire application, play around with it and give feedback. And on top of that, you do not have to incur any cloud costs also because local stack is taking care of provisioning all of that in the CI without creating actual stuff on cloud providers. So you don't have to worry about resources just running if the PR stays open for a long time. So that was it for the webinar. Uh, we have some time for Q&A right now. So if you have any questions, please, please, please let us know. I think we only ha we have one question. Uh, does this w only work with respect to AWS? What about Azure or GCP? Okay, so I can comment on the Octeto side. Octeto works with all the cloud providers, so you can host your Octeto instance on any Kubernetes cluster. It can even be a local Kubernetes cluster or on any cloud provider you want. And if you want to create actual resources on the cloud provider, we have support for that as well. Uh, I'll let Harsh answer the part about local stack and uh, what resources it can emulate. Uh, right now, local stack only emulates AWS. I guess uh, that is one of the factors that we are still building on. And definitely you will see support for Azure coming right about maybe this year, maybe the next one. I'm not sure about that. Uh, we have also started the support for Snowflake. Uh, so Snowflake is one of the central cloud providers that basically allows you to create data applications. So if in the future, uh, like the Snowflake support is fleshed out, you will also see something like running Snowflake applications with Octato. And I guess this would be quite awesome as well. Yep, I hope that answers your question. Cool. Do we have any more questions? Please, please feel free to write them out. We are happy to chat and even stay longer if folks have more questions. Okay, I think uh, I don't see any more questions, so we can uh, wrap up the webinar. And um, folks, if you like this and would like to see, you know, how this was working behind the scenes, how we configured this, Harsh showed a Octeto YAML, and we did not uh, like we did not get a chance to, you know, touch on the code because we wanted to keep it high level. But if you are interested in seeing that, please, please let us know. And we are planning to put out like a tutorial and a blog post, so that would be really helpful uh, for you all. So. Uh, let us know if that's the kind of content you're interested in and we'll share that with you over emails. And um, one last thing I would like to plug is that if you are interested in DevX or platform engineering, we have recently launched our newsletter, which is DevX All Day. So if you just go to this URL, which we'll put in the chat, devxallday.com, or you just scan this QR code, you can sign up for that newsletter and we, th that's a really great place to keep yourself up to date with all the things which are happening in the platform engineering world, the trends, and it's based on our experiences with talking to folks who are in this platform engineering space. Um, that was one thing I really wanted to highlight. Harsh, is there anything you want to plug from the local stack side? Uh, now's the I time guess to just, do that. 
yeah, I guess just join our Slack community if you're interested in local stack. Uh, we have a pretty strong uh, open source community code base that basically allows you to get started really quick, either on your local machine or using the Octi2 uh, development environment itself. And again, if you have got any questions, just reach out to us or the Slack itself. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess you can just go to localstack.cloud slash Slack. I guess that's the whole invite link. Cool. All right. Once again, thank you so much for joining for our session today. We really hope this was valuable and I'll see you in the next webinar.